All right, I believe I am live. Yep, I believe I am live. So, give people a few minutes to come along. To make sure everybody can come on. So when you get online, let me know. do this one with my mask on, but I might have to. So let me get that on. So let me know. You still all ought to be able to hear me and understand me okay, but let me know. I'm trying to speak as close to the mic as I can and as close to the camera as I can. Get my big old nose underneath, <laughs> underneath the mask. Okay. All right. I'm going to start right at seven. So I am outside, but underneath the Starbucks canopy. Uh, I want to get some light right. So let me know if you can hear me and let me know if you can understand. <coughs> okay. All right, tonight is our 
Hold on, seven o'clock. Okay, time to go. Tonight is <coughs> No More Genies 34. Okay, uh, it was God Part 2. Now, if you know anything about my No More Genies series, that's about getting rid of. Thank you, too. That's about getting rid of our genie concept of God and replacing it with a true and a biblical concept of God. And I always encourage you to go back to the beginning and watch this series from the beginning because I go into more depth as to what that really means because genie concept has messed up a lot of people. There are so many people that have been messed up in their lives because they had a non-biblical, they had a non-biblical concept of God. They had a, a something that was based on Christian myth, something that was based on religion, something that was based on hearsay. It was based on everything except what the scriptures actually say. Okay, and so we need to look into that. We need to look at what the scriptures actually say. And so this last series I started has been a series called. Who is God? All right, let me see if I'm gonna. Uh, let me see if I'm gonna be able to take my mask yeah, off. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I should be able to. Okay, good. So, this last series that I'm doing is a series called Who is God? The reason that I'm doing a series called Who is God is because. During 2020, God took his mighty hand and tore down everything we were doing. All the religious institution stuff, all the religious stuff we were doing is gone now. Think about it. Think about it. There's not one of us, there's my sister, hey sis, there's not one of us that goes to church like we used to. There's not one of us where everything is like it used to be. Uh, the worship just, there's nothing the same. And some of us may not ever, ever gather together in those situations again. So what we have now is a golden opportunity because all the religious stuff has been torn down. So what we have is a golden opportunity to study what the scriptures actually say. And I talked about it on part one last week that we wanna put the first things first. So I'm not gonna reteach that, but I encourage you to go watch part one last week because part one I talked about whenever God says something is first, then it's first, okay? And he said the first and great commandment was to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. So if God says something is first, it's supposed to be first. And sometimes we go to church for a 10 and a 20 and a 30 years and never really actually learn who God is, and never really actually learn how to love the Lord. So I talked about all that last time. So what I'm gonna talk about this time is, who is God part two? We're going to go over some more attributes of God's love, some things that you may not know about how God loves you. Remember last time I talked about the most important thing you could do as soon as you get saved is sit down and learn how to let God love you. That's not what they told you in church. And they told you, they told you in church, don't be a bench warmer. They told you in church, don't be a pew member. They told you to get busy. And they taught you how to get busy doing church work, but maybe they never taught you the work of the church. And the work of the church is to help you establish your relationship with God. So tonight, what we're going to talk about is some more attributes of God and his love so you can draw closer to him and uh, strengthen your relationship with God and do the first thing, which is learn how to love the Lord your God. Okay? This is a golden opportunity that we have now. Quick prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this evening, Lord. Uh, I must decrease, you must increase. So speak through me, breathe through me. Oh God, let what is said, what you want to be said, that you might be glorified in all things, that we might be edified and draw ever closer to you. I thank you for it and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. Who is God, part two? Okay. First thing I'm going to teach you, 
is that God's love is not based on how you act. You may have heard me say that before, but I'm going to show you again in the scripture. Romans 5 8. The scripture says, <clears throat> For God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, uh, King James says, For God commendeth. That's another, that's an old English word that means demonstrate. For God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means that God's love is not based on how you act. Now, that's one of the things that trips a lot of people out. And the reason it trips so many people out is because our love is very much based on how you act. <laughs> if you treat people well, they treat you well. If you don't treat them well, they don't treat you well. And so one of the first things you have to learn when you're walking in your relationship with God is you are going to have to stop trying to bring God down to a human level. Stop trying to bring the Lord down to a human level. That is the problem. You keep trying to relate to God as if he were human. He is not human. Our love is conditional. Our love, we treat people that we like better. We treat people that we find attractive better. That is not who God is. God's love is not based on how you act. What that means is that you can come to him no matter what you've done. It does not mean there won't be consequences. It does not mean unconditional acceptance of behavior. That is not what it means. It means acceptance in any condition. That means there's no state, no condition, no height, no depth, no width, no place that you could rise to or sink to where God wouldn't love you. Did you know that God even loves the people in hell? God loves the people in hell and the Lord doesn't want them to be there. But that was their choice because God respects your choice, okay? So you have to remember that when you come into God's presence through prayer, that his love's not based on, on how you act, that he just loves you, okay? That doesn't mean there won't be consequences for your actions, okay? Because unconditional love does not mean there are no consequences. It means, it does not mean unconditional acceptance of behavior. It means acceptance in any condition. You can drag yourself before the throne of God. Sometimes, sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you haven't brushed your teeth yet in the morning. Sometimes you're, where, whatever you are on your head or your heart, you can come before God in any condition and he loves you. That is not like anybody else you know. You are never gonna meet anybody where that is true, okay? But it is true for your creator, <clears throat> okay? Next principle I'm gonna teach you is how God says, come unto me. The Lord says, I know you have a problem in this area, but come unto me, I love you anyway. Let me say that one more time. God says, I know you have a problem in this area, but come unto me. I love you anyway. That is based on Matthew 11, 28 and 30, which I'm going to read for you now. This is also the scripture I wrote, probably my most famous song on, Come Unto Me. Okay? Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the Lord says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. One of the mistakes that we make, one of the primary mistakes that we make in our relationship with God is that when we get weary or burdened, or in trouble, sometimes we run away from him. I want you to think about the times in your life where, where maybe you made a mistake or maybe you messed up or maybe something happened that wasn't your fault, but you were in a rough situation. Many times our fear and our sense of condemnation or guilt stop us from becoming from before the Lord. But that's not what the Lord said. That's not what the word says. 
So that's what I'm saying. You're going to have to throw out all of those wrong human ideas and listen to what God is actually saying. And God says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, all, the, all those that are heavy and burdened. What does that mean? If you're burdened with grief, if you're burdened with financial debt, if you're burdened with some type of chronic a medical condition, if you're burdened with the breakup of a relationship, maybe the loss of a parent, if you're burdened with joblessness or homelessness or whatever it is that you're going through, God says you can come to him and in exchange for your burden, he's going to give you rest. You will discover by living that the only place that you can find the rest you want in life is actually with Christ. You're going to want to find it in a lot of human relationships, sometimes with your parents, sometimes with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, sometimes with your spouse, sometimes with your pastor, your prophet, your apostle, your teacher. But the kind of rest that you're looking for, you will discover by living, you can actually only find it in Christ. There's nowhere else you can go. There's nowhere else you can go to find the rest you're looking for. Let me read it one more time. The Lord says here, if you're weary and burdened, he'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. If the Lord tells us, now one translation says, learn of me. This translation I'm reading now says, learn from me. But the point is, is that it's not automatic. Why would the Lord say we have to learn of him? Why would the Lord say we have to learn from him if it's automatic? That means you have to spend time in the presence of Jesus. You have to spend time in his word and you have to spend time in prayer in his presence with him because you have to learn. You have to learn him. You have to learn how he is and you have to learn what it is he's trying to teach you. Can you see that? Can you also see that going to church for two hours on Sunday is not going to cut it? Do you talk to your children for two hours on Sunday? Do you talk to your husband or your wife for two hours on Sunday? Do you talk to your best friend for two hours on Sunday and expect to maintain a close relationship? Do you do that anywhere else in your life? Nope. There's nowhere else in your life where you put two hours in a week. And sometimes you don't even do that every week and expect some type of close relationship. Just think about it. We don't treat any other relationship like that. And it's the same thing. It's true with the Lord. You have to spend time with him. You got to learn from him. Okay. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. What that means is that serving God is not heaven. But then you say, how come we go through so many things? That's the devil. That's sin. That's your own flesh. That's the sin curse of this world. That's not God. How do I know it's not God? Because anything the Lord wants you to do, he gives you the power to do. He empowers you. He enables you to do whatever it is he wants you to do. He never expects you to do it on your own. See? All that other stuff we go through is because of sin and Satan. That's not the Lord. Okay? All right? Let's go on to our next principle. The next principle is that God will love you out of your unloveliness. <laughs> God's desire is to love you out of your unloveliness. What does that mean? That means that as you continue to fellowship with God, you think, and I'm going to talk about this later, you think that the Lord is like people because you know what people do? People try to shame you. People try to make you feel ashamed. And that's what they use to make you change. People try to guilt trip you. OK, uh, sometimes people just yell at you because they're so angry. Have you ever had somebody just get really angry, and just yell at you over and over and over and over again? Because that's the way we do it. Have you, haven't you ever had somebody get in your face and tell you that they were going to give you a piece of their mind and they just told you off and they just told you about yourself? Have you ever done that or been on the receiving end of that? Has that ever happened to you? Because that is what we do. We think that listing someone's faults and listing someone's flaws and using fear, uh, guilt, and shame is the way for people to change. But that doesn't work. That just makes people withdraw from you. That just makes people angry, makes them shut down, it makes them disconnect from you. Okay? That is not the way of God. What God does is he's going to love you out of your unloveliness. If you've got... 
some unlovely traits, the Lord is going to love you out of them. Now, a part of love is love is not always just warm fuzzies. A part of love is chastisement, discipline, correction. When you look up love, particularly in the New Testament, when you look it up in the Greek, you can see that love is not just the nurturing and the warmth. The love is also, it means discipline, it means chastisement, it means correction. So sometimes the Lord's love is going to involve chastisement or correction, but that is just as much a part of love as anything else. But the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So in other words, even if the Lord says something that cuts, that convicts you, that cuts you to your heart, he's doing that to help you get better. Even though it hurts, He's doing it to help you face something you don't want to face. Even though it hurts, he's doing it to help you overcome. Okay? Because God is going to love you out of your loveliness. That's what he wants to do. If you go anywhere else, especially if you go to people, they're probably going to use shame or fear or guilt or yelling or control. They're probably going to throw your faults and your flaws in your face on a regular basis. That's not the way of God. Even when God chastises and corrects, okay, it's so you can become better, not to condemn you, okay, but to help you become better. Okay, that's principle number three. Principle number four. Principle number four is that God does not force us to change. God encourages us to change. Now remember, and I'm gonna read this scripture for you because this scripture is found in Deuteronomy. Remember that God's not gonna force you. Once again, that's people, that's the devil, trying to impose their will on you, trying to impose what they want on you, okay? But God doesn't force. God gives you a choice. And I'm gonna read that for you in the scripture. Put the scripture on the screen so you know where I'm reading. Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 through 20. Okay. <clears throat> I'm reading out of King James Version. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God. There it is, as I love to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over the Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou that, may, that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto them, cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days. And that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Now, if that is not crystal clear, I don't know what is. God does not force you to change. He encourages you to change. You can look in the world around you and tell that God does not make people serve him. What has probably happened in your life is you've been around some mean old religious people. <laughs> you've been around some mean old religious people. Faces all frowned up, all scowling. The huffy stuffies are all self-righteous always talking bad about everybody else, always criticizing. And if you grew up like that in church, you got the wrong idea. That's where we get so many of those wrong ideas from, all that bad teaching. But I just read it for you in Deuteronomy 30, that God gives you the commandment, God tells you what to do, but he's not gonna make you do it. He's not gonna force you to serve him. He tells you the truth and lets you choose. He said, if you wanna live, and if you wanna live long, and if you want to live well, God says, then you have to listen to me. Keep my commandments. Do what I'm telling you. Don't turn to other gods to serve them. God said, if you turn away from me and go after other gods to serve them, God said, you're surely going to perish. He sets before you life and death, blessing and cursing, good and evil. But the choice is yours. 
So he doesn't force you to change. He encourages you to change. He says, therefore, choose life so that both thou and thy seed may live. You see that? That's not a force. That's an encouragement. Okay? So don't be paying attention to the mean or religious people that stuck their finger and wag their finger in your face and try to beat you and frown you into that because God's not going to force you. He's going to tell you the truth. He sets life and death before you, and the choice is yours. He opens his hand and gives you his commandments and said, if you want to live, listen to me. And he says, if you don't listen to me, then you're going to perish. Choice is yours, but he's going to tell you the truth and then leave the choice up to you. Okay? All right, next principle. I'm going through this quickly because I want to be sure to get them all in in this session. All right. Next principle that I want to give you is that God's love is not shallow. Okay. God's love is not shallow. And I'm going to read for you John 15 and 13. Okay, so I'm reading out of John 15 and 13. And John 15 and 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. So in other words, the Lord is not superficial. His love is not fickle. Haven't you ever dealt with someone and they love is fickle, like they love you today, but they don't love you tomorrow? And they love superficial things about you, like they might love the way you look, but if you don't look that way anymore, all of a sudden all that love just run away. Or they might love your money. And if that money run out, all of a sudden they don't love you anymore. <laughs> Or they might love you when you're in shape. And if being in shape goes away, then all of a sudden all they love just goes away. See, that is not the Lord's love. The Lord is not shallow. And the way he proves that he's not shallow is that he died. He gave his life for you. He said, I actually could not love you any more than to lay down my life for you. The Lord said there is no greater expression of love than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. That means that, you know how we use that, that expression, do you have skin in the game? Okay, that is literally true for the Lord. He literally put his literal skin in the game. So in other words, the Lord cannot possibly invest any more in you because he invested his life in you. There's, there's, there's nothing to top that. There's nothing above that. There's no greater investment than for somebody to invest their very life in you. So because he invested his life in you, he literally has his skin in the game and his love for you is not shallow. It's not superficial. That's why some of y'all, because, you know, you've heard me say it before and we talk about it a lot. Ain't no hurt like church hurt. Now, you do have to get over church hurt and you do have to heal and you can get over it. But ain't no hurt like church hurt because people that you once thought just loved you and just loved you and just loved you. Sometimes you find out they can turn on you. And sometimes that, that hurts in ways that it's hard to describe. Okay? The Lord's love is not like that. His love is not like that. He's got his little skin in the game to prove that he's not shallow. He's not superficial. You see what I mean? See, so many times these songs that we sing, these songs that we're singing, the love we're looking for is Jesus' love. We keep thinking we're going to find that in people, and that's why we end up getting so disappointed. But the love that we're actually looking for is his love. Okay? Moving on to the next principle. All right. Next principle is... that God will never betray you. Oh my goodness. God will never betray you. God will never betray you. God will never betray you. Now the reason that is so important is because one of the favorite tricks of the devil 
is to come at you really, 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 really hard and then tell you that that was somehow God's fault. Accidents, tragedies, and then sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes we're reaping a harvest. Sometimes we have sown onto something and then we reap from it, okay? But the Lord is never gonna betray us. Out of that, I'm gonna read Hebrews 13 and five. And Hebrews 13 and five says that I will never leave thee. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, the bottom part. Yeah, Hebrews 13, five B. Uh, for, because God has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. That's Hebrews 13, 5, uh, 13, 5 B. Actually, so it's the bottom part of the verse. God says, I'm not going to leave you. But God said, I'm not going to turn my back on you. God said, I'm not going to forsake you. Because God will never betray you. So sometimes what happens in life is that things happen that we didn't expect to happen. And they can make you feel betrayed by God, but God never betrays us. What we have to do is seek his face so we can understand what's going on, so we can understand what's happening, so we can understand what he's saying, but he himself will never betray us, even in the darkest of times. Because I have been through some dark times in my life, and I found out that the Lord was right there with me. What we want God to do is to stop the dark times, but the dark times happen because the sin curse is in the earth and the sin curse being in the earth is not God's fault. The reason that the sin curse, curse is in the earth is because of Adam, because Adam ate from the tree of knowledge and good and evil and brought the sin curse into the earth realm. That's why sin and death and poverty and sickness and all that stuff we hate, that's why it's here, okay? It's like my sister said, people be like, where's God? God's right there. God did not betray you. But we live in a sin cursed world. We live in a world where the devil is. We live in a world where we have a choice. We live in a world where sin is. We live in a world that's been cursed by sin. And so bad things happen. And we want God to stop the dark times. But you're going to go through some dark times sometime. It's not going to be summer all the time. Summer are going to give way to fall. And fall going to give way to winter. And winter gonna give way to spring, and it's gonna be seasonal. And you're gonna go through some dark times sometimes, because I done been through some dark times, I'm a living witness. But it's in those times I found out that even when I was overwhelmed, even when I was in over my head, even when I didn't know what to do, even when I was out, when I was spent, you know, sometimes you can be in a situation in life where you're just spent. I found out that God was right there, that he never forsook me, that he never turned his back on me, that he never left me, and he never betrayed me. I may not have understood what was going on at the time, but he never betrayed me. What we have to do is we have to seek his face so we can get an understanding of what's happening. But he's not going to betray me, okay? That's why I keep saying we keep trying to find all this stuff in people. This stuff we're looking for is in God. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me give you the next one. Okay. Next principle is that God does not have a critical spirit. And that's Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Now, you're probably familiar with the scripture, but uh, we're going to show some new things from it. I hope you can hear me from, with all this background noise going on. I know this noise is kind of loud, but I hope you can hear me. I'm talking as close to the mic as I can. So we're going to read Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 says, Judge not that you be not judged. And that word that's translated judge in English is better translated criticize. What that word actually says in the Greek is criticize not, that you be not criticized. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? 
thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So what the Lord says there is, don't be critical. God himself does not have a critical spirit. So in other words, the Lord is not up in heaven, always making a, always making a list of all your faults, okay? He's not making a list of all your faults. It's not like I'm on the expressway where I'm right next to a busy street. So he's not making a list of all your faults. <coughs> you see that? He's not critical. And once again, if you grew up around mean church people, you're used to being around very, very critical people because ain't nobody critical like church people. I've met people, I've met secular people, I've met people in, in the world. I've met people that claim no religion. I've met people that didn't know God at all. They were much easier to be around the church people. Because ain't nobody critical like church people. But everybody talking about God don't know him. And everybody singing about heaven ain't going. <laughs> because God does not have a critical spirit. There's a psalm that says, if thou, O Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, who can stand? If God was judging us according to our iniquities, nobody could stand. The only one without iniquity is Jesus. All the rest of us, we just folks. But he doesn't have a critical spirit. He has a merciful spirit, or else mankind could not survive. Okay, we're almost done. Let me give you the next couple principles. Okay, God wants a relationship with you. He wants to walk with you and talk with you and be your friend. Oh, I forgot to put the number. That's number eight. Okay. God wants a relationship. He wants to walk with you and talk with you and be your friend. That's Jeremiah 31 and 34. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Jeremiah 31 and 34 says, uh, no longer will each man teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and will remember their sins no more. There it is. There forever puts to rest this idea that there's big eyes and little U's in the kingdom of God. That's not the truth. God said, I want all my children to know me from the least to the greatest. Oh man, when I read that this afternoon and I was preparing for this lesson, that just blessed my heart that it, your station in life doesn't matter to the Lord, it matters to people. People are gonna treat you different if they think you're famous. People are gonna treat you different if they think you're good looking. People are gonna treat you different if they think you have money. Not the Lord. The Lord says, I want all my children to know me. Let me read that one more time. Because that blessed my heart this afternoon. God said, no longer will each man teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, know the Lord. Because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and I will, and will remember their sins no more. God's grace is for everybody. God's forgiveness is for everybody. And knowing God is for everybody. Don't you let anybody tell you. See, see, we all have different revelations of God. We all get to, to learn different things as we walk with God. And the reason we have pastors, preachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists is to share the revelations that we all get from God because don't know one person get all the revelation. But all of that is to help you in your relationship with God, not to substitute in your relationship with God. You see that? Because God said we're all supposed to know him from the least to the greatest. Uh, that just blessed my whole heart. Okay? All right. And here is our last principle for tonight. Here's our last principle for tonight. And that is, hmm, you're getting a little chilly. Hold on, I got a zip up. It was so warm yesterday. It was like 68 here in Chicago. It was like almost 70 degrees. I 
Hold on, I'm trying to, trying to zip my coat. All right. Because it's getting just a little bit chilly out here. Just a little bit chilly, a little bit chilly. Okay. So our last principle is right here. God is not riding around heaven waiting to catch you in some sin. That's the accuser, the slanderer. Okay, one more time. God is not riding around heaven waiting to catch you in some sin. That's the accuser, that's the devil, the slanderer. So I'm going to read for you Revelation 12, 1 through 11. Then we're going to read from Job. Revelation 12, 1 through 11. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Okay, that's the sign of Mary giving birth to the Christ child. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his head. That's the devil. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. That's the demons, that's the angels that became demons that followed Lucifer when he got kicked out of heaven. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That's Jesus. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard, oh, this is what my book is about, my novel is about this very thing. Then I heard my novel series. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser, of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. And they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So in other words, the, the one that's always accusing you, the one that's always bringing up your past, the one that's always bringing up your mistakes, the one that's always fault finding, that's the devil. And that's people full of the devil. Those are the kind of people that do that. Fault finding, criticizing, bringing up your past, all that different kind of stuff. That is the devil. That's where that comes from. He's the accuser, not God. He's the one always trying to catch you with something. That's the devil and people full of the devil. That's not God, okay? In a Job 1, 6, 1 through 12, uh, well, I'll just summarize that for you. Basically, the devil comes before the throne of God and God is bragging on Job. And God says to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil says, does Job fear God for nothing? You have a hedge about him, but if you take the hedge down, he'll curse you to your face. So in other words, the point of that, the reason that's in the Bible is because God is trying to show us that the devil always has, always has something bad to say. The devil is the one. He's always got something bad to say about you and what you're doing. You see that? He's the accuser. He's the slanderer. That's Satan. That's not God. Okay? All right. That's our lesson for tonight. I wanted to give you, I gave you nine principles about who God is, who God is part two. Okay? God's love is not based on how you act. You can come to God with anything. God's desire is to love you out of your unloveliness. God doesn't force you to change. He encourages you to change. God's love is not shallow. God will never betray you. God doesn't have a critical spirit. God wants a relationship. He wants to walk with you and talk with you and be your friend, no matter who you are. And finally, God is not riding around heaven to catch you, waiting to catch you in some sin. That's the accuser, the slanderer. Okay? 
So now you can use these principles and use these scriptures I gave you to help you further develop your relationship with God. Okay? Prove them out. Test them out. Come into the Lord's presence. Pray these scriptures back to him and ask him to give you even further revelation on it. Okay? All right. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen so I can pray for you right now before we sign off. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Thank you, sis, for that encouragement. My sister said, good lesson. Okay, now remember I told you. Yes, sir. Remember I told you that each week I am trying to increase my reach. I'm trying to increase my reach, so I can't increase my reach by myself. So each week I'm going to ask you to do one thing, one thing to help me expand my ministry so that, uh, praying for my sister, I'm always praying for you, sis, uh, to, so that more people can hear the prophetic word of God. So what I'm going to ask you to do tonight is I'm going to ask you to follow the YouTube channel of my music ministry. It's called Shades of the Cross. Shades of the Cross is my prophetic music ministry. I'm going to put the channel link in the chat. I want you to go to that YouTube channel right now and subscribe, okay? I want you to subscribe to that channel <clears throat> because that helps me uh, when the videos are liked and when the videos are uploaded. And that helps me, more video views we get. So go check out my prophetic music ministry. So that is my prophetic music ministry is Shades of the Cross. Okay, I've already got some videos there. And I'm working on new music all the time. I'm going to drop a lot more music uh, this year. I'm working on a hymn. I'm going to sing, uh, My faith looks up to thee, thou lamb. Of Calvary, Savior, divine. Well, that does sound like I'm on the highway, don't it? So anyway, I'm working on recording that here. I'm gonna put that out, and uh, so yeah, I have a whole music ministry that I'm doing. So uh, I definitely want you to check that out. So check that out. It's Shades of the Cross, and I put the YouTube link in the chat. So go to that link and subscribe to that channel. All right. All right. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for those of you that are tuned in tonight and watch me live. Thanks for those of you that are watching the replay. I will be back this Sunday at my regular time, uh, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, for the weekly live prophetic word right here on Facebook Live. Okay? Thanks. Uh, God bless you. And remember that God is love and God loves you. Amen.